Wealth and Its Uses, was addressed to the students of Union College at Schenectady, New York, on January 25, 1895, by Andrew Carnegie. Wealth and Its Uses Wealth, as Mr. Gladstone has recently said, is the business of the world. The fact that the acquisition of money is the business of the world arises from the fact that, with a few unfortunate exceptions, young men are born into poverty and therefore under the salutary operation of that remarkably wise law that makes for their good. Thou shalt earn thy bread by the sweat of thy brow. It is the fashion nowadays to bewail poverty as an evil, to pity the young man who is not born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but I heartily subscribe to President Garfield's doctrine that the richest heritage a young man can be born to is poverty. I make no idle prediction when I say that it is from that class from whom the good and the great will spring. It is not from the sons of the millionaire or the noble that the world receives its teachers, its martyrs, its inventors, its statesmen, its poets, or even its men of affairs. It is from the cottage of the poor that all these springs. We can scarcely read one among the few immortal names that were not born to die, or who has rendered exceptional service to our race, who had not the advantage of being cradled, nursed, and reared in the stimulating school of poverty. There is nothing so enervating, nothing so deadly in its effects upon the qualities that lead to the highest achievement, moral or intellectual, as hereditary wealth. And if there is among you a young man who feels that he is not compelled to exert himself in order to earn and live from his own efforts, I tender him my profound sympathy. Should such a person prove an exception to his fellows and become a citizen living a life creditable to himself and useful to the state, instead of my profound sympathy, I bow before him with profound reverence. For one who overcomes the seductive temptations that surround hereditary wealth is of the salt of the earth and entitled to double honor. One gets a great many good things from the New York Sun, the distinguished proprietor and editor of which you had recently the pleasure, benefit, and honor of hearing. I beg to read this to you as one of its numerous rays of light. Our boys. Every moralist hard up for a theme asks at intervals, what is the matter with the sons of our rich and great men? The question is followed by statistics on the wickedness and bad endings of such sons. The trouble with the moralists is that they put the question on the wrong end first. There is nothing wrong with those foolish sons, except that they are unlucky, but there is something wrong with their fathers. Suppose that a fine specimen of an old deer hound, very successful in his business, should collect untold deer in the park, fatten them up, and then say to his puppies, here, boys, I've had a hard life catching these deer, and I mean to see you enjoy yourselves. I'm so used to racing through the woods and hunting that I can't get out of the habit, but you boys just pile into that park and help yourselves. Such a deer hound as that would be scorned by every human father. The human father would say to such a dog, Mr. Hound, you're simply ruining those puppies. Too much meat and no exercise will give them the mange and 17 other troubles, and if distemper doesn't kill them, they will be a knock-kneed, watery-eyed lot of disgraces to you. For heaven's sake, keep them down to dog biscuits and work them hard. That same human father does with great pride the very thing that he would condemn in a dog or a cat. He ruins his children, and then, when he gets old, profusely and sadly observes that he has done everything for them, and yet they have disappointed him. He who gives his son an office that he has not deserved, and enables him to disgrace his father and friends deserves no more sympathy than any Mr. Fagan deliberately educating a boy to be dishonest. The fat, useless pug dogs that young women drag wheezing about at the end of strings are not to blame for their condition, and the same thing is true of rich men's sons. The young women who overfeed the dogs and the fathers who ruin their sons have themselves to thank. 
No man would advocate the thing, but who can doubt that if there could be a law making it impossible for a man to inherit anything but a good education and a good constitution, it would supply us in short order with a better lot of men. This is sound. If you see it in the sun, it is so. At least it is in this case. It is not the poor young man who goes forth to his work in the morning and labors until the evening that we should pity. It is the son of the rich man, whom providence has not been so kind as to trust with this honorable task. It is not the busy man, but the man of idleness, who should arouse our sympathy and cause us sorrow. Happy is the man who has found his work, says Carlyle. I say, happy is the man who has to work, to work hard, and to work long. A great poet has said, he prays best who loves best. Some day this may be parodied into, he prays best who works best. An honest day's work well performed is not a bad sort of prayer. The cry goes forth often nowadays, abolish poverty. But fortunately, this cannot be done, and the poor are always with us. Abolish poverty, and what would become of the race? Progress and development would cease. Consider its future if it is dependent on the rich. The supply of the good and the great would cease, and human society would retrograde into barbarism. Abolish luxury, if you please, but leave us the soil upon which alone the virtues and all that is precious in human character grow. Poverty, honest poverty. I will assume for the moment, gentlemen, that you were all fortunate enough to be born poor. Then the first question that presses upon you is this. What shall I learn to do for the community that will bring me enough wealth to feed, clothe, lodge, and keep me independent of charitable aid from others? What shall I do for a living? And the young man may like, or think that he would like, to do one thing rather than another, to pursue one branch or another, to be a businessman or craftsman of some kind, or minister, physician, electrician, architect, editor, or lawyer. I have no doubt some of you, in your wildest dreams, aspire to be journalists. But it does not matter what the young man likes or dislikes. He always has to keep in view the main point. Can I attain such a measure of proficiency in the branch preferred as will certainly enable me to earn a livelihood through its practice? The young man, therefore, who resolves to make himself useful to his kind, and is therefore entitled to receive in return from a grateful community from which he benefits the sum necessary for his support, sees clearly one of the highest duties of a young man. He meets the vital question immediately pressing upon him for a decision, and he decides it rightly. So far, then, there is no difference in the acquisition of wealth. Everyone agrees that it is the first duty of a young man to train himself so as to be self-supporting. Nor is there difficulty about the next step, for the young man cannot be said to have performed the whole of his duty if he leaves out of account the contingencies of life, liability to accident, illness, and trade depressions like the present. Wisdom calls upon him to have regard for these things, and it is a part of his duty that he begin to save a portion of his earnings and invest them, not in speculation but in securities, property, or a legitimate business in such form as will perhaps slowly but surely grow into the reserve upon which he can fall back in emergencies or in old age and live upon his own savings. I think we are all agreed as to the advisability nay, the duty of laying up competence and, hence, retaining our self-respect. Besides this, I take it that some of you have already decided, just as soon as possible, to ask a certain young lady to share his lot, or perhaps his lots, and of course, he should have a lot or two to share. Marriage is a very serious business indeed, and it gives rise to many weighty considerations. Be sure to marry a woman with good common sense was the advice given me by my mentor, and I just handed it down to you. Common sense is the most uncommon and valuable quality in a man or woman. But before you have occasion to provide yourself with a helpmate, there comes the subject upon which I am to address you, wealth, 
not wealth in millions, but simply revenue sufficient for modest, independent living. This opens up the entire subject of wealth to a greater or lesser degree. Now, what is wealth? How is it created and distributed? There are not far from us immense beds of coal that have lain for millions of years useless and therefore valueless. Through some experiment or perhaps an accident, it was discovered that black stone would burn and give forth heat. Men sank shafts, erected machinery, mined and brought forth coal, and sold it to the community. It displaced the use of wood as fuel, say at one half the cost. Immediately, every bed of coal became valuable because it was useful or capable of being made so. And here, a new article worth hundreds, yes, thousands of millions, was added to the wealth of the community. A Scotch mechanic one day, as the story goes, gazing into the fire upon which water was boiling in a kettle, saw the steam raise the lid, as hundreds of thousands had seen before him. But none saw in that sight what he did. The steam engine, which does the work of the world at a cost so infinitely trifling compared with what the plans known before involved, that the wealth of the world has been increased, one dares not estimate how much. The saving that the community makes is the root of wealth in any branch of material development. Now, a young man's labor or service to the community creates wealth just in proportion as his service is useful to the community, as it either saves or improves upon existing methods. Commodore Vanderbilt saw, I think, 13 different short railway lines between New York and Buffalo, involving 13 different managements and a disjointed and tedious service. Albany, Schenectady, Utica, Syracuse, Auburn, Rochester, etc., were heads of some of these companies. He consolidated them all, making one direct line over which your Empire State Express flies 51 miles an hour, the fastest time in the world, and a hundred passengers patronized the lines where one did in the olden days. He rendered the community a special service, which being followed by others, reduced the cost of bringing food from the prairies of the West to your doors to a trifling sum per ton. He produced, and is producing, untold wealth to the community by so doing, and the profit he reaped for himself was but a drop in the bucket compared with that which he showered upon the state and the nation. This audiobook is produced by Wealth Books, copyright 2024. In the olden days, before steam, electricity, or any other of the modern inventions that have changed the whole aspect of the world, everything was done on a small scale. There was no room for great ideas to operate on a large scale and thus produce great wealth for the inventor, discoverer, originator, or executive. New inventions provided this opportunity, and many large fortunes were made by individuals. But in our day, we are rapidly passing, if we have not already passed, this stage of development, and few large fortunes can now be made in any part of the world, except for one cause, the rise in the value of real estate. Manufacturing, transportation both upon land and upon sea, banking and insurance have all passed into the hands of corporations composed of hundreds, and in many cases, thousands of shareholders. The New York Central Railroad is owned by more than 10,000 shareholders. The Pennsylvania Railroad is owned by more people than the vast army it employs. And nearly one-fourth of the number are the estates of women and children. It is so with the great manufacturing companies, so with the great steamship lines. It is so, as you know, with banks, insurance companies, and indeed with all branches of business. It is a great mistake for young men to say to themselves, oh, we cannot enter into business. If any of you have saved as much as $50 or $100, I do not know any branch of business into which you cannot plunge at once. You can get your certificate of stock and attend the meeting of stockholders, make your speeches and suggestions, quarrel with the president and instruct the management of the affairs of the company, and have all the rights and influence of an owner. 
You can buy shares in anything, from newspapers to tenement houses. But capital is so poorly paid these days that I advise you to exercise much caution before you invest. As I have said to working men and to ministers, college professors, artists, musicians, physicians, and all the professional classes, do not invest in any business concerns whatever. The risks of business are not for such as you. Buy a home for yourself first. And if you have any surplus, buy another lot or another house, or take a mortgage upon one or upon a railway, and let it be a first mortgage, and be satisfied with moderate interest. Do you know that out of every hundred that attempt business upon their own account, statistics are said to show that 95 sooner or later fail? I know that from my own experience. I can quote the lines of Hudibras and tell you, as far as one manufacturing branch is concerned, that what he found to be true is still true to an eminent degree today. What perils do environ the man that meddles with cold iron? The shareholders of iron and steel concerns today can certify that this is so, whether the iron or steel is hot or cold, and such is also the case in other branches of business. The principal complaint against our industrial conditions today is that they cause great wealth to flow into the hands of the few. Well, of the very few, indeed, is this true? It was formerly so, as I have explained, immediately after the new inventions changed the conditions of the world. Today, it is not true. Wealth is being more and more distributed among the many. The amount of the combined profits of labor and capital that goes to labor was never as great as it is today, and the amount going to capital is never so small. While the earnings of capital have fallen more than one half and in many cases have been entirely obliterated, statistics prove that the earnings of labor were never as high as they were prior to the recent unprecedented depression in business, while the cost of living, the necessaries of life have fallen in some cases nearly one half. Great Britain has an income tax, and our country is to be subject to this imposition for a time. The British returns show that during the 11 years from 1876 to 1887, the number of men receiving from $750 to $2,500 per year increased by more than 21% while the number received from $5,000 to $25,000 actually decreased by 2%. You may be sure, gentlemen, that the question of the distribution of wealth is settling itself rapidly under present conditions and settling itself in the right direction. The few rich are getting poorer, and the toiling masses are getting richer. Nevertheless, a few exceptional men may yet make fortunes, but these will be more moderate than in the past. This may not be quite as fortunate for the masses of people as is now believed, because great accumulations of wealth in the hands of one enterprising man who still toils on are sometimes the most productive of all the forms of wealth. Take the richest man the world ever saw, who died in New York some years ago. What was found in his case? With the exception of a small percentage used for daily expenses, his entire fortune and all its surplus earnings were invested in enterprises that developed the railway system of our country, which gives the people the cheapest transportation known. Whether the millionaire wishes it or not, he cannot evade the law, which, under present conditions, compels him to use his millions for the good of the people. All that he gets during the few years of his life is that he may live in a finer house and surround himself with finer furniture and works of art, which may be added. He could even have a grander library and more of the gods around him. But, as far as I have known millionaires, the library is the least used part of what he would probably consider furniture in all his mansions. He can eat richer food and drink richer wines, which only hurts him. But truly, the modern millionaire is generally a man of very simple tastes and even miserly habits. He spends little upon himself and is the toiling bee laying up the honey in the industrial hive, which all the inmates of that hive and the community in general will certainly enjoy. 
Here is the true description of the millionaire as given by Mr. Carter in his remarkable speech before the Bering Sea Tribunal in Paris. Those who are most successful in the acquisition of property and who acquire it to such an enormous extent are the very men who are able to control it, to invest it, and to handle it in the way most useful to society. It is because they have those qualities that they are able to engross it to such a large extent. They really own, in any sense of the word, only what they consume. The rest is all held for the benefit of the public. They are the custodians of it. They invest it. They see that it is put into this employment, that employment, another employment. All labor is employed by it and employed in the best manner, and it is thus made the most productive. These men who acquire these hundreds of millions are really groaning under a servitude to the rest of society, for that is practically their condition, and society really endures it because it is best for them that it should be so. Here is another estimate by a no less remarkable man. Your friend, Mr. Dana, justly said at Cornell, that is one class of men that I refer to, the thinkers, the men of science, the inventors, and the other class is that of those whom God has endowed with a genius for saving, for getting rich, for bringing wealth together, for accumulating and concentrating money, men against whom it is now fashionable to declaim, and against whom legislation is sometimes directed. And yet, is there any benefactor of humanity who is to be envied more in his achievements, in his memory, and in the monuments he has left behind him than Ezra Cornell? Or, to take another example that is here before our eyes, more than Henry Sage. These are men who knew how to get rich because they had been endowed with that faculty, and when they got rich, they knew how to give it to great public enterprises for uses that will remain living and immortal as long as man remains upon earth. This audiobook is produced by Wealth Books, copyright 2024. The men of genius and the men of money, those who prepare new agencies of life, and those who accumulate and save the money for great enterprises and great public works, these are the leaders of the world as the 20th century is opening upon us. The bees of a hive do not destroy the honey-making bees, but the drones. It will be a great mistake for the community to shoot the millionaires for they are the bees that make the most honey and contribute most to the hive even after they have gorged themselves fully. It is a remarkable fact that any country is prosperous and comfortable in proportion to the number of its millionaires. Take Russia, with its population little better than serfs, and living at the point of starvation upon the meanest fare such fare as none of our people could or would eat, and you find comparatively few millionaires, excepting the emperor and a few nobles who own the land. It is the same to a great extent in Germany, although in recent years industrial development has produced a few pound sterling millionaires. In Berlin in 1902, three had more than six million dollars, and in Russia, six persons had an income of one million dollars. In France, where the people are better off than in Germany, you can count only a few millionaires. In the old home of our race, in Britain, which is the richest country in the world save one our own, there are more millionaires in pounds sterling, which may be considered the European standard, than in the whole of the rest of Europe, and its people are better off than in any other. You come to our own land. We probably have more millionaires and multimillionaires, both in pounds and dollars, than all the rest of the world put together, although we have not one of every ten that is reputed to be so. I have seen a list of supposed millionaires prepared by a well-known lawyer in Brooklyn, which made me laugh, as did many others. I saw men rated there as millionaires who could not pay their debts. Some should have had a cipher cut from their reputed millions. Some time ago, I sat next to Mr. Evarts at dinner, and the conversation touched upon the idea that men should distribute their wealth during their lives for the public good. One gentleman said that was correct, giving many reasons, one of which was that, of course, they could not take it with them at death. 
Well, said Mr. Evarts, I do not know about that. My experience as a New York lawyer is that somehow or other they do succeed in taking at least four-fifths of it. Their reputed wealth was never found at death. Whatever the ideal conditions may develop, it seems to me that Mr. Carter and Mr. Dana are right. Under present conditions, the millionaire who toils on is the cheapest article the community secures at the price it pays for him, namely, his shelter, clothing, and food. The inventions of today lead to the concentration of industrial and commercial affairs into huge concerns. You cannot work the Bessemer process successfully without employing thousands of men on one spot. You could not make the armor for ships without first expending $7 million, as the Bethlehem Company has spent. You cannot make a yard of cotton goods in competition with the world without having an immense factory and thousands of men and women aiding in the process. The great electric establishment here in your town succeeds because it has spent millions and is prepared to do its work on a great scale. Under such conditions, it is impossible but wealth will flow into the hands of a few men in prosperous times beyond their needs. But out of fifty great fortunes that Mr. Blaine had a list made of, he found only one man who was reputed to have made a large fortune in manufacturing. Fortunes are most often made from real estate. Next come transportation and banking. The whole manufacturing world is owned by one millionaire. But assuming that surplus wealth flows into the hands of a few men, what is their duty? How is the struggle for dollars to be lifted from the sordid atmosphere surrounding business and made into a noble career? Now, wealth has hitherto been distributed in three ways. The first and chief one is by willing it at death to the family. Now, beyond bequeathing to those dependent upon one the revenue needful for modest and independent living, is such a use of wealth either right or wise? I ask you to think over the result as a rule, of millions given over to young men and women and the sons and daughters of the millionaire. You will find that, as a rule, it is not good for the daughters, and this is seen in the character and conduct of the men who marry them. As for the sons, you have their conditions as described in the extract that I read you from the son. Nothing is truer than this, that as a rule the almighty dollar bequeathed to sons or daughters by millions proved an almighty curse. It is not the good of the child that the millionaire parent considers when he makes these bequests. It is his own vanity. It is not affection for the child. It is self-glorification for the parent, which is at the root of this injurious disposition of wealth. There is only one thing to be said for this mode. It furnishes one of the most efficacious means of rapid distribution of wealth ever known. There is a second use of wealth, less common than the first, which is not so injurious to the community but which should bring no credit to the testator. Money is left by millionaires to public institutions when they must relax their grasp upon it. There is no grace, and there can be no blessing, in giving what cannot be withheld. It is no gift, because it is not cheerfully given but only granted at the stern summons of death. The miscarriage of these bequests, the litigation connected with them, and the manner in which they are frittered away seem to prove that the fates do not regard them with a kindly eye. We are never without a lesson that the only way to produce lasting good by giving large sums of money is for the millionaire to give as close attention to its distribution during his life as he did to its acquisition. We have today the noted case of five or six millions of dollars left by a great lawyer to found a public library in New York, an institution needed so greatly that the failure of this bequest is a misfortune. It is years since he died. The will is pronounced invalid through a flaw, although there is no doubt of the intention of the donor. It is a sad commentary on the folly of men holding the millions which they cannot use until they are unable to put them to the end they desire. Peter Cooper, Pratt of Baltimore, Pratt of Brooklyn, and others are the type of men who should be taken by you as your model. They distributed their surplus during life. 
The third use and the only noble use of surplus wealth is this, that it be regarded as a sacred trust to be administered by its possessor into whose hands it flows for the highest good of the people. Man does not live by bread alone, and five or ten cents a day more revenue scattered over thousands would produce little or no good. Accumulated into a great fund and expended as Mr. Cooper expended it for the Cooper Institute, it establishes something that will last for generations. It will educate the brain, the spiritual part of man. It furnishes a ladder upon which the aspiring poor may climb, and there is no use whatever, gentlemen, trying to help people who do not help themselves. You cannot push anyone up a ladder unless he is willing to climb a little himself. When you stop boosting, he falls, resulting in his injury. Therefore, I have often said, and I now repeat, that the day is coming, and already we see its dawn, in which the man who dies possessed of millions of available wealth, which was free and in his hands ready to be distributed, will die disgraced. Of course, I do not mean that the man in business may not be stricken down with his capital in the business, which cannot be withdrawn, for capital is the tool with which he works his wonders and produces more wealth. I refer to the man who dies possessed of millions of securities, which are held simply for the interest they produce, that he may add to his hoard of miserable dollars. By administering surplus wealth during life, great wealth may become a blessing to the community, and the occupation of the businessman accumulating wealth may be elevated so as to rank even with the physician, one of the highest of our professions, because he, too, in a sense, will be a physician, looking after and trying not to cure but to prevent the ills of humanity. For those of you who are compelled or who desire to follow a business life and accumulate wealth, I commend this idea. The epitaph to which every rich man should wish himself justly entitled is that seen upon the monument to Pitt, he lived without ostentation and he died poor. Such is the man whom the future is to honor, while he who dies in old age, retired from business, possessed of millions of available wealth, is to die unwept, unhonored, and unsung. I may justly divide young men into four classes. First, those who must work for a living and set before them as their aim the acquisition of a modest competence of course, with a modest but picturesque cottage in the country. And second, one as a companion who maketh sunshine in a shady place, and is the good angel of his life. The motto of this class, one, might be given as, Give me neither poverty nor riches. From the anxieties of poverty as from the responsibilities of wealth, good Lord, deliver us. Class number two, comprising those among you who are determined to acquire wealth, whose aim in life is to belong to that much talked of and grandly abused class, the millionaires, those who start to labor for the greatest good of the greatest number, but the greatest number always number one. The motto of this class being short and to the point, put money in thy purse. Now the third class comes along. The God they worship is neither wealth nor happiness. They are inflamed with noble ambition. The desire for fame is the controlling element of their lives. Now, while this is not as ignoble as the desire for material wealth, it must be said that it betrays more vanity. The shrine of fame has many worshippers. The element of vanity is seen in its fiercest phase among those who come before the public. It is well known, for instance, that musicians, actors, and even painters, all the artistic class, are peculiarly prone to excessive personal vanity. This has often been wondered at, but the reason probably is that the musician, the actor, and even the painter may be transcendent in their special line without being even highly educated or having an all-around brain. Some peculiarities, some element in his character, may give him prominence or fame, so that his love of art or of use through art is entirely drowned by a narrow, selfish, personal vanity. But we find this liability in a lesser degree all through the professions, 
the politician, the lawyer, and, with reverence be it spoken, sometimes the minister less, I think, in the physician than in any of the professions, probably because he, more than in any other profession, is called to deal with the sad realities of life face to face. He of all men sees the vanity of vanities. An illustration of this class is well drawn in Hotspur's address. By heavens it were an easy leap to pluck bright honor from the pale-faced moon, or dive into the bottom of the deep where fathom line could never touch the ground, and pluck up drowned honor by the locks, so he that doth redeem her thence might wear without Corival all her dignities. Mark, young gentleman, he cares not for use, he cares not for state, he cares only for himself, and, as a vain peacock, struts across the stage. Now, gentlemen, it does not seem to me that the love of wealth is the controlling desire of so many as the love of fame, and this is a matter for sincere congratulations, and proves that under the irresistible laws of evolution, the race is slowly moving onward and upward. Take the whole range of the artistic world, which gives sweetness and light to life, which refines and adorns, and surely the great composer, painter, pianist, lawyer, judge, and statesman, all those in public life, care less for millions than for their professional reputation in their respective fields of labor. What cared Washington, Franklin, Lincoln, or Grant and Sherman for wealth? Nothing. What cared about Harrison or Cleveland two poor men, not unworthy successors? What cares the judges of our Supreme Court, or even the leading counsel that pleads before them? The great preachers, physicians, and teachers are not concerned about the acquisition of wealth. The treasure they seek is in the reputation acquired through their service to others, and this is certainly a great step from the millionaire class, who struggle to old age, and through old age to the verge of the grave, with no ambition, apparently, except to add to their pile of miserable dollars. But there is a fourth class, higher than all the preceding, who worship neither at the shrine of wealth nor fame, but at the noblest of all shrines, the shrine of service service to the race. Self-abnegation is its watchword. Members of this inner and higher circle seek not popular applause and are concerned not with being popular but with being right. They say with Confucius, It concerns me not that I have no high office. What concerns me is to make myself worthy of office. It is not cast down by poverty nor unduly elated by prosperity. The man belonging to this class simply seeks to do his duty day by day in such a manner as may enable him to honor himself, fearing nothing but his own self-reproach. I have known men and women not prominently before the public, for this class courts not prominence, but who in their lives proved themselves to have reached this ideal stage. Now I will give you for this class the fitting illustration from the words of a Scotch poet who died altogether too young. I will go forth among men, not mailed in scorn, but in the armor of pure intent. Great duties are before me and great songs, and whether I am crowned or crownless when I fall, it matters not, so long as God's work is done. I've learned to prize the quiet lightning deed, not the applauding thunder at its heels, which men call fame. Then, gentlemen, standing upon the threshold of life, you have the good, better, and best presented to you the three stages of development, the natural, spiritual, and celestial, as they may fitly be called. One has success in material things of its aim, not without benefit for the race as a whole, because it lifts the individual from the animal and demands the exercise of many valuable qualities, sobriety, industry, and self-discipline. The second rises still higher, the reward sought for being things more of the spirit, not gross and material, but invisible, and not of the flesh, but of the brain, the spiritual part of man, and this brings into play innumerable virtues which make good and useful men. 
The third, or celestial class, stands on an entirely different footing from the others in that selfish considerations are subordinated in the select brotherhood of the best, with the service to be done for others being the first consideration. The reward of either wealth or fame is unsought, for these have learned and know full well that virtue is its own and the only exceedingly great reward, and once enjoyed, all other rewards are not worth seeking. And so, wealth and even fame are dethroned, and there stands enthroned the highest standard of all your own approval flowing from a faithful discharge of duty as you see it, fearing no consequences, seeking no reward. It does not matter much what branch of effort your tastes or judgment draw you to. The one great point is that you should be drawn to some one branch. Then perform your whole duty in it and a little more, the little more being vastly important. We have the words of a great poet for it, that the man who does the best he can can still do more. Maintain your self-respect as the most precious jewel of all and the only true way to win the respect of others. And then remember what Emerson says, for what he says here is true. No young man can be cheated out of an honorable career in life unless he cheats himself. The end. We hope that you've enjoyed this audiobook. Subscribe to our channel so you will get notified every time we upload a new video.